First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Right, everyone, my name is Cathy Smith. I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the library system. Every good student should learn how to use the library. If you have to do a research project, the library is the place to go to for information. Libraries contain books and periodicals, magazines and newspapers on many different subjects. To find the information you need, you must know how to use the library. All libraries are organised in much the same way. Every library houses a collection of books. Many libraries also have periodicals, films and records. All the books in a library can be classified under two main categories, fiction and non-fiction. Books of fiction contain stories that were made up by the author. Books of non-fiction contain factual material. When doing research, you use non-fiction books because you are looking for factual information. All the fictional books in a library are grouped in one section. They are arranged alphabetically by the last name of the author. Many libraries also label the spines of all books of fiction with the letters FIC or F. All libraries have a system for organising and classifying non-fiction books. The most widely used system is the Dewey Decimal System. It was designed by an American librarian named Melvin Dewey. It is called a decimal system because it divides all non-fiction books into ten major categories. These are further divided into subdivisions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. For example, all science books are numbered from 500 through 599. Each different field of science has a number within the 500 category. For example, astronomy is 520 and chemistry is 540. The Dewey Decimal System provides a category for every type of non-fiction book. The best way to locate a book in the library is to use the card catalogue. The card catalogue is an index of all the books in the library. Information about a book is listed on cards. All the cards are filed alphabetically and stored in drawers in large cabinets. The card catalogue can help you locate a particular book, a book on a certain subject or a book by a particular author. In the card catalogue, each book has three cards, an author card, a title card and a subject card. The author card is alphabetised under the author's name. The title card is filed alphabetically according to the title of the book. The subject card is filed alphabetically under the name of the subject of the book. In many university libraries, they use their own Biblitus cataloguing system or the microfiche system. Both of them list publications under author and title, and both are very easy to use. Now, let us see the reference books. We all know that reference books make up important part of a library's non-fiction books collection. They contain facts and information about any subject you can think of. Reference books are not meant to be read from cover to cover. You should use them when you want important facts and information about a particular subject. Let's see some major types of reference books. First, dictionaries. Dictionaries are books that list and give the meanings of the words in a language. They also give the pronunciation of words in a dictionary which are listed alphabetically. Second is encyclopedias. 
Encyclopedias are reference books that provide factual information about people, events, places, and subjects of lasting interest. Each article is written by a specialist on the topic being discussed. An encyclopedia usually consists of a number of books arranged in a set. The volumes are arranged in alphabetical order according to the topic of each article. Letters are stamped on the spine of each volume to indicate the alphabetical rang of the topics in each volume. For instance, if you wanted to find information about the moon, you would look in volume eight of the encyclopedia pictured here. Next is atlases. An atlas is a book of maps. It may contain many different kinds of maps. The maps in an atlas are often arranged alphabetically by country or continent. Almanacs are also a type of reference books. An almanac is a book that contains recent statistics and summaries of information on a wide variety of topics. It is published annually. Information is listed alphabetically by subject. Indexes are alphabetical lists of names, titles, and subjects that tell where information about each can be found in other publications. For example, the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature can help you find magazine articles that have been published about a particular subject. It will give you the names of publications that have carried articles about the subject, the dates and volume numbers of the particular issue in which the articles appeared. You should be aware that reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances; they are used only in the library. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Section two. You are going to hear a lecture about dining services. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen to the tape and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Welcome to the dining commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say, also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home cooked food. Well, this year we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home, even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities. Is variety in student meals. Last year, there was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example. There might be Italian food at station number one, which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three, there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food, 
All students will find something to their liking. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 15 to 20. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs will prepare better tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions and also give their input as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at 6am to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed, but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also, Every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you anymore, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Caesar and a welfare officer. As you listen, answer questions 11 to 20. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good afternoon. My name's Cesar Bautisto. Hello, I'm Wendy. 
one of the welfare officers. Can I help you? Yes. I have to move out of my accommodation in two weeks, and I can't find anywhere else to live. OK. I'll need to know some details about your current situation. I'm an overseas student from the Philippines. The college gave me a temporary room for one month. I can't find anywhere else, and I have no money. Have you told the college about your position, or asked them to let you stay longer in your accommodation? No, not yet. I, I didn't think that would be possible. Well, we can contact the accommodation service on your behalf to see if they'll let you stay a little longer, until you can find an alternative. Thank you. But I'm not sure that I can find another place, as they all ask for money before moving in, and I don't have any. Yes, it is usual in this country for landlords to ask for up to a month's rent in advance. Don't you have any money at all? Hardly any. I'm waiting for my grant cheque to be sent from the Philippines at the moment. It should have been here for me to collect when I arrived in Britain, but it seems to have been lost. You can apply for emergency loan from the union if you want. The loan can be for up to £200, and we ask for a post-dated cheque for the same amount to be given to us so that we can recover the money once you receive your grant cheque. That would be very good. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'll apply, but I'm still worried about how to find new accommodation. As I said earlier, we can ask the college to extend the time you're allowed to stay in your present accommodation. They may refuse, of course. Then what will happen? If the worst comes to the worst, the union may be able to provide some very short-term emergency accommodation. If you want me to, I'll contact one or two of the addresses on the notice board and arrange for you to visit them. But what if they ask me for the rent in advance? I only have £90 left and I need that for food and books. It'll be all right. By the time they actually need the money, we'll have your emergency loan ready. Just fill in this application form and write me a cheque for £200, please. Payable to the student union. Right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for your help. I'm feeling more optimistic now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on William Kidd. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. A Pirate Story, William Kidd William Kidd, who is better known by the name Captain Kidd, was a 17th century British privateer and semi-legendary pirate who became celebrated in English literature as one of the most colourful outlaws of all time. Fortune seekers have hunted his buried treasure in vain through succeeding centuries. 
Kidd's early career is obscure. It is believed he went to sea as a youth. After 1689, he was sailing as a legitimate privateer for Great Britain against the French in the West Indies and off the coast of North America. In 1690, he was an established sea captain and ship owner in New York City, where he owned property. At various times, he was dispatched by both New York and Massachusetts to rid the coast of enemy privateers. In London in 1695, he received a royal commission to apprehend pirates who molested the ships of the East India Company in the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean. Kidd sailed from Deptford on his ship, the Adventure Galley, on February 27, 1696, called at Plymouth, and arrived at New York City on July 4th to take on more men. Avoiding the normal pirate haunts, he arrived by February 1697 at the Comoro Islands off East Africa. It was apparently some time after his arrival there that Kidd, still without having taken a prize ship, decided to turn to piracy. In August 1697, he made an unsuccessful attack on ships sailing with mocha coffee from Yemen, but later took several small ships. His refusal two months later to attack a Dutch ship nearly brought his crew to mutiny, and in an angry exchange, Kidd mortally wounded his gunner, William Moore. Kidd took his most valuable prize, the Armenian ship Queda Merchant, in January 1698, and scuttled his own unseaworthy adventure galley. When he reached Anguilla in the West Indies, April 1699, he learnt that he had been denounced as a pirate. He left the Queda Merchant at the island of Hispaniola, where the ship was possibly scuttled. In any case, it disappeared with its questionable booty and sailed in a newly purchased ship, the Antonio, to New York City, where he tried to persuade the Earl of Bellamont, then colonial governor of New York, of his innocence. Bellamont, however, sent him to England for trial, and he was found guilty, May 8th and 9th, 1701, of the murder of Moore and on five indictments of piracy. Important evidence concerning two of the piracy cases was suppressed at the trial, and some observers later questioned whether the evidence was sufficient for a guilty verdict. Kidd was hanged, and some of his treasure was recovered from Gardiner's Island off Long Island. Proceeds from his effects and goods taken from the Antonio were donated to charity. In years that followed, the name of Captain Kidd has become inseparable from the romanticised concept of the swashbuckling pirate of Western fiction. Among other stories concerning caches of treasure he supposedly buried is Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug. That is the end of part four.